Arthur was born in the summer of 1881 um, at home in Gravel Lane Cottages um, in Perth. He was the son of Elisha and Emma Oliver. Elisha, known as Leish, uh, was a coachman uh, at a stately home in Oxfordshire when he met his future wife. And they were married up there and then came down to start a family in Burheath. Arthur was the middle of nine uh, children, all of them born um, in Burheath. Now, Gravel Lane is one of those names which has been long forgotten, but the road is still there. It's just the track, really, across the green, across the common at uh, Burheath that leads from the Rygate Road to the old gravel pits. And those cottages that they lived in are still there today, now known as memory cottages. Now, they lived at number one. Um, the cottages are almost two, uh, two pairs of semi-detached cottages with a lengthwise house joining them, uh, joining them all together. And they lived at one of the cottages on the end, number one. Um, Arthur went to school uh, in Burheath in a building that's still there today called Chips Folly opposite St Mary's uh, Church. We drive past it all the time and don't think of that, but that was home to um, 100 school children um, every day of the week. Now, they were taught basic reading, writing, arithmetic, but it was also a church school, so they were given very careful and deliberate uh, religious instruction there as well. Um, the older boys would um, be prepared for life, um, their working life, by um, gardening, and so um, they had school gardens, which um, annual competitions were held to see who could, uh, who could make the best plot. And Arthur, in his final year at school, came eighth in the school's gardening competition, won a prize of a shilling and sixpence. Um, he was quite a good scholar, because we know that, because he won a prize. Um, he, was, uh, he won first prize uh, for the older scholars at the annual prize giving in his very final year um, at school, presented by one of the Buckle family, uh, one of the, the very wealthy family, whose family chapel is now the memorial chapel, uh, where Arthur's name uh, is inscribed on one of the panels. Um, after leaving school, he became a grocer's assistant. Um, at the time, Burheath had a population of about four or 500 people, uh, and it had two grocer drapers. The grocer drapers were a combination of a store selling dry goods and a, a store that sold cloth, and they were sort of the early birth of a supermarket, really, or a department store. Um, Arthur worked as an assistant at one of those two, probably the one uh, that used to stand on the green uh, that was run by uh, the Russell family. Now, he worked there for many years. Um, his brother had worked there before him, and one of his other brothers would work there um, after him. Uh, and he gave that up in the end to become an insurance salesman. Um, there are lots of men from the Prudential or, or what have you um, on their bicycles all over the district. Um, every road would have its insurance man. Uh, and of course, this is a time before we had national insurance, before we had a state-provided safety net. You had to make your own provision, and one of those ways was to take out insurance policy. So they were very busy. It was a good career um, to have. Uh, it wasn't one that Arthur held for long. He said he couldn't take telling the lies uh, and had to give it up in the end. Now, he married in uh, 1905 um, to Harriet Cordwell. Harriet uh, was the daughter of an army man. Her father had been a corporal uh, in the Suffolk Regiment. Um, her mother, uh, they'd lived, grown up living in barracks, and her mother had been a tailoress making and mending uniforms. Unfortunately, she lost her father when he was quite young, in his uh, late 30s, uh, and the family broke up. One of the daughters stayed with the mother, and all the other children went out to various different orphanages uh, and children's home. And Harriet went off, uh, went off to an orphanage. Now, she was taught to cook there. Very valuable skill, because cooks were always in demand. They earned better money uh, than run-of-the-mill uh, run maids, so it was a good profession to have. Uh, she got a job um, cooking for a vicar and his family, uh, and then came down to Burheath uh, sometime in the mid-1900s. And she, there she met um, Arthur, and they married here uh, in September 1905. At that time, there wasn't a church in Burheath, St Mary's didn't exist. But Arthur was uh, active in, in church life, uh, and he was one of the people that actually helped get that church built. He was one of the local committee, along with his father, that were appointed to, to collect funds um, towards the building work there. Uh, he was also a Sunday school teacher uh, at Burheath. He uh, answered the call to give up his uh, Sunday afternoons, his day of rest, uh, and he would have uh, been a, a teacher uh, where the children met in his old school, uh, just opposite where St Mary's had yet to be built. Uh, when that church was opened uh, in 1909, um, his second daughter, Mary Isabel, was one of the very first children uh, to be baptised there. Um, they had four children, uh, Bert, Mary Isabel, um, Percy and Olive, uh, all born in Burheath. 
They come to Banstead, oh sorry, uh, the last three of them born in Birmingham. They come to Banstead to live in Ferndale Road, just after their marriage. They lived at number 53, it was then called Four Fern Terrace. Um, but they moved back to Burheath following the death of Arthur's father. Um, they moved in two doors down from his mother and a couple of his brothers. Uh, but I'm sure I'm, his mother would be very grateful for the, the extra support and Arthur would have wanted to be with his family at, at that difficult time. Um, this coincided with his change of job, giving up his insurance job, and he became a grocer. He got his old job back again uh, at his old shop. And he rose to become the manager um, of that shop. Now they got bought out by Holland and Barrett, which that name is still on our high streets, um, today. And they had three shops in Surrey at that time, Burheath, Epsom and Sutton. It seems an odd combination, but of course Burheath is sort of the point of a triangle between, on that road junction between Sutton and Epsom, so it probably made some kind of, uh, some kind of sense. And he eventually got a, uh, a promotion, uh, a transfer to their Epsom branch and moved away. Uh, and one of his brothers came in and filled his shoes at the grocers and eventually took it on himself and ran it in his own business through the 1920s. Um, Arthur and the family moved to East Street in Epsom, um, and they were living there when, uh, when war broke out. Um, now, Arthur didn't join the army straight away. He had uh, a young family to support, um, and he was still uh, on the home front, still hadn't joined the services when conscription came in. Uh, it was only several months after conscription, it was several months after conscription before um, someone caught up with Arthur uh, and got him in December of 1916. Um, he was, it's a bit of a mystery really because he should have been, uh, should have been found back in June or July. Um, they say that he's, he was physically fit but I wonder if he was when they first introduced conscription because we changed those requirements whenever we needed more men. We suddenly, men who were B category men would suddenly find themselves physically fitter and A category men at the stroke of a pen and conscripted into the army. And that's probably what happened with Arthur. Um, he stayed at home um, still. You, there was always a delay between being called up and actually going to start your training. And it was at least three months before he began his training. He would have gone to uh, Woolwich. He was in the, uh, in the artillery, so he would have gone to Woolwich to do some basic square bashing training for a couple of weeks before he went out to, for technical training um, on how to, fire, how to fire guns, how to load guns, how to aim guns, all those sorts of things that gunners had to do. The branch of artillery he was in was the Royal Garrison Artillery. And, before the war, they'd been charged of all the really heavy guns that were in the coastal defences. But we realised soon that there wasn't really a threat from the German Navy. And so we could free up all those men and their guns to go to France, where those heavy guns were vital in smashing the German defences. And so by the end of the war, they, the Royal Garrison Artillery were operating hundreds of heavy batteries um, in France, uh, with hundreds of 100,000 men uh, manning them. Now, um, Arthur's battery that he joined uh, was a 354th siege battery. Um, now, they had been in France long before he joined them. Um, they had fought at Cambrai, um, our big tank attack that nearly smashed through the German lines. Um, it seemed to be a, it could have been a stunning victory, but the Germans turned it around, reversed the situation with a sweeping counterattack uh, that left us in a worse position than we were when we started off. And during that counterattack, uh, that, uh, that siege battery were overrun. Um, they, were, uh, they suffered a lot of casualties. Um, the gunners had to abandon their guns. Their Germans were coming behind them out of the mist. They had to abandon their guns, pick up their rifles, and fight as infantry alongside uh, men who wouldn't be expected to fight, like royal engineers, and cooks, and whoever it was that was billeted, that were billeted in the village at that time. Um, the other British artillery units nearby turned their guns on the Germans, and in the process destroyed uh, the guns of Arthur's battery. And so they had to be uh, refitted and re-equipped, but they were back in action just three weeks later. Uh, it was very shortly after that that we think Arthur joined them. Um, we've lost his service records. Um, most of the service records went up in flames in the Second World War. But there's a little note in our memorial book in the church that he went out to France in January of, of 1918. And so he joined them uh, sometime around that time in France, um, in a quarry, uh, or they were fighting, uh, they were near the front line, uh, engaged in counter-battery firing, firing over both the British and German front lines, the German guns that were similarly positioned a couple of thousand yards behind the line, and trying to knock out, uh, knock out their batteries. Now, it was a long, cold winter, it had been quiet since the autumn, but everyone knew that the Germans were going to be attacking. Uh, the, uh, you could hear them moving around at night, you could hear the trains moving. Um, aerial reconnaissance showed all the new battery positions uh, being constructed. And they assembled something like 20 or 30 batteries per kilometre um, of line, a significant amount of firepower that could smash our defences. Uh, they moved 50 divisions from the Eastern Front 
uh, to overwhelm us. And they trained, they specially trained their best troops to become stormtroopers, these well-equipped, uh, well-trained men that would uh, seek out weaknesses in the British defences uh, and uh, exploit them, uh, cause chaos as they flooded through um, our defences and break up our, our, our structure of defence, as it were, and then open the way for more troops to come afterwards. So we knew that this was all coming. We were on new ground. We'd only been there since the autumn. We hadn't got these elaborate systems of defences yet. Um, beyond, behind the front line, the reserve lines weren't yet complete, so there were massive gaps that the Germans could get through if they managed to break through uh, that front line. Uh, and it was in that atmosphere, this, this tense, expectant atmosphere, um, that Arthur and his battery found themselves after a short period of rest. Um, now, on the eve of battle, they lost their commander. He was posted elsewhere, so they had uh, a new chap, Captain Nichols, in charge, who would be going into action in, as the commander for the very first day, uh, the very first time the following day. It hardly could have been worse, um, worse timing. Now, although they don't have a war diary, his personal diary has survived and his grandson was able to, to send us a copy, and we, can, and we know quite a lot about what they were up to uh, as a result of that. Now, Arthur's battery had four six-inch howitzers, these very powerful guns that would fire their shells, almost like mortars, fire them in a very high arc um, over the lines. Now, each of those guns was crewed by ten people. Uh, they all had very specific jobs. We don't know what Arthur did, um, but there'd be a man in charge, there'd be a second-in-command, uh, there'd be a team of three men looking after shells, There'd be a small dump a little way from the guns. One of them would be in charge of fitting the fuses and cleaning the shells. The other two in his team would take turns carrying them up to the gun. Uh, there'd be a couple of guys standing at the back of the gun, and their job was to pick up the tail of the gun and rotate it through, uh, you know, rotate the gun if it needed big um, movements, and also to take the shell from those guys that brought it to them, take it right up to the gun, uh, and load it in, ram that uh, shell into the breech. Another chap would come along with a propellant cartridge, and put that in. Uh, another man, the breech man, would close the breech behind them, uh, bring the gun up to its firing position. The gun layer had already uh, trained the gun on its target. The gun commander had already given his orders for what was going to happen. The uh, breech man would put a, 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 like an igniter tube, a friction tube, into the side of the gun, attach his lanyard. Everyone would stand clear. He'd pull his lanyard, creating the friction that created the sparks that lit the propellant cartridge that sent the shell, 100 pound, 45 kilogram shell, um, flying off. Um, this team of 10 men um, had to do that every 30 seconds or so. Uh, they were doing it at speed, and they would have had to rehearse for hours together in order to, in order to get that smooth. It only take, took one of those guys not being available uh, for the whole operation to, to stop or to be significantly slowed. So there were also a team of spare men waiting to step up uh, and take their places if they fell. The gun team were covering a stretch of line uh, behind 5th Army. Now, 5th Army had been very thinly stretched. The French had had to move south to deal with the German attack there, uh, and 5th Army had uh, expanded their frontage by 30 miles uh, in order to, to fill that gap. And that meant that they were quite thin. They'd already suffered a lot of casualties fighting at Passchendaele uh, in the autumn, so they were a very vulnerable position. And if the British were going to break under the German attack, it was going to be in this sector, the sector that Arthur's battery were supporting. They were just a little bit uh, behind the action uh, when the Germans began their massive bombardment, a five-hour bombardment, and they fired more shells in that time than the British had fired in their entire week-long preliminary bombardment uh, for the Somme. Uh, they wiped out the British uh, defences, cut the wire to ribbons, wiped the trenches uh, from the face of the map, um, and began their attack. And it was only a few hours after that um, that one section of Arthur's battery was sent up the road towards the action, another was sent back to a rear position in case we had to fall back. And they began to open fire. Now, they only got about 35 rounds away, that front section, in that first day. Um, the British just about, we just about held our line throughout that first day, although men were starting to fall back. We began to, we began to properly re retreat um, in the evening. We couldn't hold on uh, any longer. Uh, the Germans had got in between our defences. We hadn't got a good defensive system in place. We didn't quite know what we were doing with it. Uh, and they managed to exploit the weaknesses that were there. Fifth Army fell back. Third Army was secure, but they had to bring their right flank back as well uh, to conform to Fifth Army. Otherwise, this huge gap would open that the Germans could, could push through. And so they began to fall back towards Arthur and his, and, and his guns. Now, they were thousands of yards behind because these guns had such a huge range. 
But they, even so, they had to move pretty quickly, otherwise they were in danger of, of getting overrun. So they pulled back uh, to, to join the rear section, uh, and on the second day of, of this action, they fired something like 200, uh, 200 shells um, to try and cover that British retreat <coughs> in front of them. Now that line in front of them, it never broke. It did bend, and it was always being pushed backwards, but it held intact. It might have seemed like chaos to the gunners with all the people streaming back along the road, all the wounded going past them, but they were not in, a, not in immediate danger as long as they kept pace with that retreat, as long as they kept moving back. And they did over the next few days. We retreated back over the River Somme uh, at one of the intact crossings there. We didn't blow the crossings over the Somme. We had, didn't have time to do it. Uh, we didn't have time to do a proper job of it. And so the Germans were able to follow us right on our heels. <coughs> and Arthur's uh, battery retreated to lots of different points, moving every half day or every day, never safe in one place for long, uh, trying to stop the trying to at least just slow the Germans down uh, more than anything. Um, they, with such chaos on the movement, of course, the rations were in short supply. And so it was only on the, uh, the fourth day, uh, as snow fell, uh, of this attack, that they finally got bacon and eggs for a long time, which apparently made all the men extremely cheerful. Um, the cheer cheeriness didn't last for long, however, because they were shelled that afternoon uh, and hit, uh, I think, 200 times or something like that, 200 shells falling in the vicinity um, of their battery, and several men uh, were wounded. Uh, the retreat continued. Um, General Foch of the French forces took command in order to prevent a gap opening up between the British and the French, which was threatening, and he ordered that not an inch of ground should be given up after that. But he was quite an astute, adept commander. He didn't really mean what he said. He wanted to give people the emotion to fight uh, for every yard, but he knew that it didn't make sense to hold a bad bit of ground, and so he did allow withdrawals to happen. And it was one of those withdrawals um, that allowed the Germans a six-mile advance that brought them very, very close to Arthur's Battery. Now, they were in a village called Cerisi, which is on the south bank of the River Somme. Uh, it's, uh, it's on a crossing, just the other side is a little village called Chipoli, uh, and there's a bridge between, between the two. That bridge was still intact, and if the Germans could take that, then they could get in behind the British line. We'd fallen back further north of the river than we had south of the river, so we had this little dog leg, uh, and that bridge was a very vulnerable point. Arthur's Battery were right by that bridge, in the, they were about uh, maybe six, seven hundred yards away from that bridge at the time, in the village of Cerisi. And at 10.30 in the morning, on the 27th um, of March, uh, they saw German troops descending from the high ground behind the village and to the river bank. Uh, they opened fire on the village of Chipoli, just a thousand yards away uh, from their position. The Germans uh, made their way to the crossing and they started to force their way across the river. Now the battery were out in the open, they were very visible. The German guns had also come up behind their infantry and they shelled um, Arthur's battery, wounding one man, probably Arthur. Um, they, the battery retreated under heavy shell fire to the safety of the flank of a hill. Um, there was uh, uh, two, two uh, long spurs either side of them, uh, and they retreated behind the spur uh, that was on this side of them, the Germans over there. Um, and so they were in safety, and they continued to be in action for the rest of the day. They didn't lose any other men apart from that man that may well have been Arthur, and they managed to withdraw all of their guns and stores under fire, and were in action uh, very soon afterwards. Uh, in the evening, uh, they retreated again to a nearby village of Warfuse, and that's where the German infantry caught up with the British uh, gunners. Uh, they were uh, subject to machine gun fire uh, from German patrols. The commanding officer had to take cover under a turnip heap, which I imagine is quite an, an, an uncomfortable way to spend the night. Uh, and eventually in the morning, uh, they, had to, they had to leave. They had to retreat along the road, chock full of uh, refugees with their cows and their wagons full of, uh, wagons full of their furniture. Arthur's wound uh, was in his head, we believe. Um, it wasn't thought to be serious at the time, not a blighty one, but he was put on an ambulance train uh, to be evacuated to Rouen. Um, his condition deteriorated, and at some point between getting on that train and getting to that hospital uh, in Rouen, he died. Um, he is buried in, uh, in a cemetery uh, full of hundreds of men that died in the, in the huge base hospital complex at Rouen. At the foot of his grave is the grave of a man um, who lived in the same road uh, that Harriet lived in in Ashton. She moved there just towards the end of the war. A strange, strange coincidence. Um, Arthur is commemorated on the Ashton War Memorial, on the Epsom War Memorial, Epsom Cemetery, uh, on the War Memorial in St. Martin's Church in Epsom, in the St. Martin's Book of Remembrance, 
um, on the Roll of Honour in the Burheath War Memorial Hall, on the memorial panels uh, at St Mary's, um, on the memorial panels here uh, in the corner of the church in the memorial chapel, and in our memorial book as well. He was 36 years old and left a widow and four young children. Thank you, James, for that wonderful story about Arthur. Let us pray. Father of all, remember your promise and look with love on all your people, living and departed. On this day, we especially remember Arthur Culver and ask that you would hold forever him and all those who suffered during the First World War those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned, those who mourned, and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember too, those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their own lives for their comrades, and those who in the aftermath of war work tirelessly for a more peaceful world. And as you remember them, remember us. O oh Lord, grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when people of every language, race and nation will be brought into the unity of Christ's kingdom. This we ask in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Would you please stand? When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave power today. God grant to the living grace, the departed rest, the church, the queen, the commonwealth, and all the world, peace and concord. And to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.